Welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Josh Kraus, Chief Operating Officer at Fox Point. Thanks for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jesse. Thanks for having me on. No, it's it's great to have you on here, Josh. Um, it was great kind of having a conversation with you a few weeks back. Um, I've known Fox Point for, I want to say, maybe six, seven years now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Midwest organization. Love to chat with Midwest people. So um, appreciate your time today, man. Yeah, I always have a special place in my heart for Big 12 people, too. So I know you're a West Virginia guy. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it, it immediately, it's, it's immediately the tie that binds, right? So, um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And then and then I saw where Texas and Oklahoma are going to leave at the end of next year. And it's like, hmm. see you later. We'll Bye. be fine without you. Uh, we started without you. We added you in. And now you're leaving. We're going to be just fine. Yeah. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so, you know, Josh, for the people who might not be familiar with yourself, do you mind just kind of talking about your career to date and kind of what sure. brought you to Fox Point? Yeah, and I'll try to I'll try to craft both paths simultaneously. So, I'll, I'll start on the Fox Point side. Um, this October will be ten years for us. We are a uh, technology company uh, that has found itself in the middle of transportation. Um, Specifically, we've we, we've got a our let me let me rephrase. We're a technology company found in the middle of transportation. Our founders, uh, the core members at the beginning of the organization, they weren't truck drivers. Um, they were technology people. They were they were financial services people. Um, some people that came off of uh, Wall Street and recognized that they're in the uh, late. 2008, 2009, beginning of the 2010s era, that a lot of carriers were moving to an asset light model and that the ability for a truck driver uh, to own their own piece of equipment was a rather large hurdle. And so we entered into the market in 2013 to try to bridge that gap um, and make it a little bit, make, make the hurdle not as large as it was at the time. Um, and since then, we've revamped, we've changed, uh, we've changed policies, we've added a significant amount of um, additional thought process and technology, and, and now uh, a whole bunch of mistakes that we've made in the last almost 10 okay. years, uh, right, to be able to, um, one of the things that we do provide is we provide class A, generally 90, 95% of our fleet uh, of 1,500 are uh, class eight sleeper trucks that are used in over the road uh, line haul for drivers. Um, we, we do have a small subset that own multiple trucks, but the majority of our portfolio are all individual owner operators. Uh, we are not a carrier. Um, we, we, we don't have freight. Uh, we simply provide the figurative and literal vehicle to achieve the dreams of every truck driver out there, which is owning their own truck. Um, so my background, um, I, uh, as mentioned before, being a Big 12 guy, I graduated from K-State um, in the middle of uh, 05 and uh, found myself out in the real world doing uh, low-level analyst work. My degree is in economics. Um, and I don't say that analyst work is low level. I was saying that I was so poor at it. I was at the low level of the analyst <laughs> side. And uh, 08 happened. And uh, being able yeah. to sit around and watch trading stop. Um, once again, central Kansas is not known as one of the financial uh, nerve centers of the United States. Uh, but we did have access in, uh, in our small firm to Bloomberg. And I, I distinctly remember <clears throat> in my early 20s sitting around that Bloomberg machine and trying to ascertain, for lack of a better term, what the hell was happening. Um, in the middle of that, uh, that time frame, um, I, I felt that I had a pretty strong resume. We, we moved states for some personal decisions um, and came to find out that most banks where I was probably a best fit for um, were starting to retract. They weren't hiring people. They were actually sure. terminating locations. Sure. And found myself like a lot of other millennials uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. Married uh, <laughs> with, a, with a kid on the way. Uh, what am I doing here? And uh, reached out to my, uh, my area of dominant influence and found a job working at a car dealership. Um, this is where things turn a little bit counter. I flipping loved the car business. I still love it. I haven't been in it for five years, but 
I, I spent the next 10, 12 years of my life um, outside of the fixed side, which would be your service side. I, I was in all aspects uh, of the car dealership uh, world. And, and it was so rewarding. I made so many mistakes in management. I made so many mistakes in making decisions. Um, the, the leadership group that I was surrounded by gave me the ability. Uh, basically, it was, hey, you can make any mistake you want to make once, but don't ever make it a second time, sure. um, which, which was such a wonderful environment for me to learn how to manage people. Um, salespeople are not every person you run into, though they may make it seem that way when you talk to a salesperson. Uh, but cutting your teeth on learning how to manage salespeople um, understand the environment. I, I don't think I could have scripted it better. Um, I really was able to uh, hone my craft in that post 2008 market of, of credit in a subprime environment. Um, when I started, actually, I think subprime was listed as below a 700. And I think then they moved it down to below a 650, regardless um, right. uh, for a beacon score. Regardless, there, there is a large subset of people that are very reliable that 08 had a really harmful impact on their credit. Um, yeah. and, and a conversation about the equity of credit scores is probably a, a conversation that we can have, but probably not for this platform. Um, but I, I, really <laughs> learned, I really learned some of the, uh, I learned all of my base skills about subprime lending through being directly in front of the consumer and interfacing directly with the lender on behalf of the consumer uh, for the majority of my career in the car business. And um, just as anybody who, who does the same thing for 10 plus years, you kind of get an idea of some of the, the rules and, and what the road looks like and, and what the speed limit is and when you can pass. Um, sure. And was presented with an opportunity in, in early 2018 uh, to join the Fox Point team. Our, uh, our consumer brand is uh, OTR Leasing. And um, they were just beginning to expand their portfolio. At the time, the portfolio was 300 and some trucks. Um, I came on board and I, I can take credit on paper or in a board presentation or in a, in a PowerPoint <laughs> that I grew the portfolio to 1500, but um, those were coincidental. The, the company was primed to succeed. Uh, I was able to help implement a ton of policies and procedures and, and cement some things about how we do it with my experience. Uh, with subprime lending, with my experience with the sale specifically to a subprime um, sure. customer. And not all truck drivers are subprime, but all truck drivers um, typically are, that, that lease their own truck are 1099. Um, and, and that experience was also very beneficial. And so, um, you know, in our, in our growth, we were able to um, really, really explode in, in 2020, right before the pandemic hit. We, we made significant changes. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that um, because we spoke about it, Jesse. Uh, we, we recognized that there is a, a distinct respect challenge for drivers um, that I think is present in the entire industry of transportation. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm younger relative uh, to being in an executive role, generally speaking. Uh, so my life experience may not count for much. So take it with a grain of salt. But rarely do you run into someone who is um, aggressive and defensive at the same time on the first meeting. That's typically a learned behavior. And the, the amount of trust that we had to build with drivers, the uh, the amount of over communicating that we're uh, we're not trying to simply sell a used truck and then have it break yeah. down two days later. Uh, we're married to the asset for the full life of the lease. So sure. So we we didn't really exude that mindset uh, as we grew. And so in 2020, we kind of put a line in the sand and and. Um, we, we decided to, to change the direction of the ship. Um, we're not all the way there yet, but, but some of the things that we did was we moved from a position of managing assets only to actually being a, a member-focused um, ecosystem to where 
we we developed a we, we didn't have it before. Uh, we we developed a full on member services department to communicate any sort of challenge that a driver would have um, that we didn't really have the resources for. We were a startup. We we were lean, and so we expanded upon people that had plenty of experience um, in this space to be able to help drivers. Um, remediate some of the challenges that you face when you're on the road. We partnered with people uh, to be able to help, you know, in, in things that we have no experience in, like, how do you file my taxes? Or, hey, I don't want to drive for myself anymore. I need to drive for a carrier. Uh, I kind of trust you. I barely trust you, Fox Point, but do you have anybody you would refer me to? And, and through, you know, now we're three years into that ecosystem, we're seeing in the environment where we're the first point of contact for that driver uh, for any sort of challenge that they've got inside of the transportation industry. Um, so, you know, without getting specific, it, it's very rewarding to have taking on such a large task of changing culture, but, but also you, you can say that, right? Um, one of my favorite authors, Andy Stanley, has a quote that says, what, what is spoken in the halls trumps what is written on the walls, right? I can go throw $2,000 on some cool graphics and have a company meeting and hand out new core values that sound really fantastic. Um, yeah. but, to, but to see that running live with our, our members being able to communicate, um, and, and we've expanded. So um, inside of just leasing trucks, we're providing uh, telematics uh, information at, at no additional cost to our drivers. Uh, where we're not only proactive, but we can also be reactive in case there's something going on. Um, but I've got a team of people that are calling customers, as a good example, that are speeding, right? Now, nobody in their truck wants to get a phone call and says, you know, how no, maternal... No, 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 no let, me, let, me, let me hold on there. Is it while they're actually speeding or is it yeah. later that day? Yeah, no, it, it's while they're speeding. Um, <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and, and I'm like, so yo, you, stop. Well, it's it, so he, let me let me let me let me tweak it a little bit. It's it's not a it's not like a a, a maternalistic. Hey, why are you speeding? It's, oh no no oh no no no. I I, it's, I get it. It's, it's just like the, oh, it's, would you would would you like the Allstate drive wise? It's like no, I don't want you to know that I just right. cut that person off or I just went really aggressive down this thing here. Like, oh, right, really <laughs> like, there's, there's enough oversight in the trucks. No, it's the conversation of. Hey, I got an alert that you're you're traveling at a high rate of speed. I, just a reminder: typically, the faster you drive, the worse fuel economy you have, and the worse fuel economy you have, the less money you make on a weekly basis. And I I'm not trying to get you to to pay me any money, and I'm not telling you that you're an idiot for driving poorly. I'm trying to have you make a business decision of sure. whether or not it's worth it for you to risk an accident or risk a ticket or have decreased fuel economy to, to provide for your see, business. See, and, see that's, a, that, that's an interesting way of looking at that because I never would have thought about it that way. Maybe if you're driving fast, yeah, you're more likely to get an accident. I never would have pieced the, the fuel economy together, but it's also one of those things where I'm not trying to steal any of what you're saying, but can you determine if someone maybe doesn't have enough sleep based on what the telematics are telling you? Right. There's well. So the only reason we arrived at such a wonderful phone call is all of the horrible phone calls we made prior. Uh, <laughs> yo, dog. Yo. Uh, hey, it's Krause here, Fox Point. Slow the down, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, those yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. Those don't work. Uh, those those yeah. don't work at all. Um, and and so being proactive. Another really good example that's really fresh is, um, hey Jesse, uh, saw that you have an indicator light on. Um, I know that you've been driving a long time and you know you can probably get to your next load and then, and then figure out what's going on. Uh, based on what the computer is telling us, uh, you've got roughly about 15 minutes to make a decision as to whether or not you want to do a $1,200 repair at the next shop or whether you're going to be paying for an engine. Um, that, that's what our data is showing. And I'm not telling you what to do. I can tell you what I recommend. You're the owner. But we are sure. trying, we're trying to be the tide that raises all ships and and treat drivers as they want to be treated and as they need sure. to be treated as business owners. 
Um, because one of the other things that we've learned is just because you can, and this is what I tell my family, just because you can go eat a whole bunch of miles uh, like Pac-Man on, on the highway and you can change your own oil on a, on a Cummins diesel engine, uh, doesn't mean you're a good business person. Um, and as we've seen some of the volatility in spot rates versus um, fuel prices versus the inverse relationship right now of contract rates being higher than spot rates, excuse me, yeah. as we see that, um, the successful drivers, the successful members in our organization uh, are, are pretty savvy business people. Um, my boss likes to communicate his brother-in-law is a very good chef, uh, but would be an absolutely horrible restaurant owner. And, and so as we are determining someone's ability to be that restaurant owner, to be that business driver, uh, we're not trying to communicate negatively to them. We're just trying to force the business decision to happen and then be sure. able to help remediate, right? So as an example, we do have carrier relationships because what carrier in the United States right now doesn't want to have additional capacity without having to front money for a, a, a new asset, right? I got a driver. Sure with a truck and he can run. So we've got, we got plenty of resources there. Uh, we've got plenty of relationships with shops nationwide. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a benefit to us being able to help. Um, and, and, and we're actively trying to provide a high level of respect to our, to our members so that they can succeed. And like I said, we are not, we are not there yet. Um, where we are versus three years ago is significant. Um, sure. But it, there's, there's still a ton left there um, because we're only impacting, uh, just throwing out numbers. I, I don't know if I could actually vet them or if I would hand on the Bible and say it. I think there's, depending on who you ask, three and a half million truck drivers in the United States. I think at any given moment, even with market volatility, you got about a half a million that are driving their own truck. Um, maybe it's higher or slower, but that's the only subset that we're working with is that half a million. I don't have half a million, by the way. I think, I think in the history of the company, we've only reached maybe 120, 150,000 total people. But, but even that half a million is only 14% of the entire truck driving population. And so sure. the amount of respect that we apply to our members and the people we come into contact with, there still is a huge, there's a huge disconnect between let me rephrase. There's a huge disconnect between how a truck driver is viewed and now being at Fox Point um, for five years, um, I, I've recognized that and I can get pretty fired up about it. Uh, most people in business are familiar with Pareto, right? You, you spend 80% of your time on 20% of your stuff. Um, yep. that's, that's where you spend the focus. And so a, a lot of people in our industry want to point at the one bad apple, the one truck driver. Um, there, if there's one bad truck driver that you're, you're building your processes around, then there's four sure. truck drivers that actually demand a higher level of respect. And, and, and you're picking the wrong guy to set the watermark at. And I, I, once again, I can get pretty fired up about that. There, there's enough information. There's enough of a platform that drivers have. Um, and, and let's not kid ourselves. They know that there's bad apples in what they do too. It's no different than I stand before you as a majority of my career being a used car salesman. Uh, you wanna talk about outside of a turn, uh, uh, who get the most crap in Hollywood yeah. and, and jokes, right? Like, but I'm, I'm a, I was a fantastic used car salesman, right? And, and it wasn't shady and it wasn't shisty and, and, and you didn't get taken advantage of. And yeah, maybe the next guy you did, uh, whatever, whatever name you want to ascribe to him over at that place over there, uh, it's the same way sure. with truck drivers. And, um, you know, I, I point a lot of the resolution. I, I, I push and project that the resolution to the truck driver respect challenges lies a lot on the institution that's inside of it. Um, you know, the example that I, I use with my father, my father is 77. Um, he has all but uh, a doctorate in theater. Um, and he's not very familiar with uh, some of the inner workings of um, logistics. And as I was talking to him recently about some respect challenges, he said, well, I mean, Josh, you can get a whole bunch of really kind dogs. And if all you're doing is whipping them, 
um, then eventually they're going to bite, right? And and you can take the kindest human being, and if you're mean to them consistently, they're going to, for self-preservation, reciprocate. And so truck drivers are not dogs. I need to make sure that that's clear. <laughs> but you can't you can't expect a response out of a truck driver that you yourself wouldn't wouldn't do. And so if if people consistently tried to get you to agree to a, a specific agreement and then change the agreement once you showed up or then cause you to wait or whatever the case, specific case may be, if you wouldn't tolerate that internally, then then why do you think somebody else should? So sure. I, and, and once again, I'm, I'm limited in my experience in logistics uh, to be able to have really, really specific uh, solutions. Uh, but I do place most of the onus on the institutions that are there, the brokerages, the carriers, the distribution centers, uh, because you'll have the change there that will impact the market. That, that, that's kind of my thought process. No, and there's so much stuff that you've uh, that we've rattled off, and that's a really thorough background and everything else. But so much stuff to kind of unpack with some of those things. And you know, I know it's always the fail fast or you know, fail forward or all that stuff. And it's like, why do we need to fail? But you don't necessarily need to fail, but you need to empower people to make their own educated, tactical decisions. Yeah. But when you do that, you can't penalize them if it doesn't work out. Right. Um, as long as it's there's some creative thought there and it makes factual sense, by all means, go do it. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, that's fantastic. So. Yeah, let me add excuse me, let me add a couple of points there. Um, so there's a, there's a group of people that I play basketball with every Friday morning, real early. And, um, of course, when I, when I got the promotion, uh, into the executive office, um, I made a LinkedIn post, of course, I'm like, Hey, everybody look at me. I'm fantastic. Uh, I don't know who wouldn't. <laughs> and one of the guys that I've been playing basketball with for the better part of three or four years, he said, uh, you know, how the heck did you pull that off? Because pro I started with Fox point, um, as the, as the sales manager. And then I moved up to the VP of sales and then I moved up to the VP of sales and marketing. And then next thing, you know, I'm the COO. Um, and, and what I communicated was, um, I don't really understand how my path took the role that it did, but what I kept doing over and over and over again was, um, I, I kept making sure I knew what the rules of the game were for failure. And I tried it to provide myself. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> No, I, I don't promote anything that's behind me. I'm listening to you. I'm just being no, extremely fine. rude. I don't know what's, I don't know what is going on here today, but whatever. there we go. So I'm sorry. Sorry. All right, we're, we're back. Okay. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah. I what, what I was saying was, uh, <laughs> one of my buddies asked me, "Hey, how how the heck did you did you land this?" And I said, "You know, I was placed in an environment to be able to try to creatively solve challenges because nothing's really new." Right, we can try to say it's new, um, but but you can always have a fresh perspective. Understand what the binds for my failure are. Um, I can't go make a million dollar mistake. Uh, I can't go make a ten thousand dollar mistake. Uh, but I can make a two hundred and fifty dollar mistake, and there's a lot of those that you can make that are sure. way better than 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 success. And one of the things I'm I'm not I'm not tattooed myself, but if I was, one of the things I would put on my forearm would be success is a poor teacher. Um, and, and I think, I think that's important to understand, um, success is not bad. It's also not binary. It's not like, uh, right now I'm in Kansas city and we're the, the chief's parade is, uh, miles away from me, you know, and we're celebrating success in a binary environment. It's either win or lose business life. Our company, our company is not binary. Uh, it is not win or lose. It's, uh, either that worked or it didn't work yet. How do we get it to work? And sure. when everything you try works, uh, you stop trying to figure out how to how to get yeah. better, right? So so that's yeah. the basis for my you know success is a is is a poor teacher. It's fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I I lo I love success and I celebrate the heck out of it. But sure. uh, I'm I'm much I'm much more excited about someone telling me how wrong I am or how something that I thought was pretty much bulletproof failed, uh, because then you get to figure out how to do it right. Uh, you you have that ability to go to go win there. So. Um, yeah, and no, I, I, think mean, our, I think our company point. has done that pretty well. We, we've made quite a bit of mistakes. Um, some of the, the 
China trade war in 2019 that we found ourselves in, some of the little bit of freight recession we found in 2019, even some of the environments we found where um, a good example for us in sourcing units, uh, we, we bought used semi trucks in the high teens in May of 2020. And in June of 2022, we paid $79,000 for some trucks. Right. Yeah. So well, I, I mean, what was going on then? I mean, I think at one point you're like the trucking industry. Oh my God, we're going to, no one needs this stuff anymore. We're all locked down. We don't, we're right. not going anywhere. Like we don't need, oh my God, is it going to be another 2008, 2009? And then we're a complete opposite. <laughs> right. right. And then in the middle of all that, all, you know, due to COVID and semiconductors, I mean, go pick which one you want to make the, the fault. Um, sure. Peterbilt, Kenworth, uh, they weren't making new trucks. So everybody was keeping their trucks. And, 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 and we had this saying around here, that truck is sort of, it's solid gold, man. Like um, sure. it, you know, we had people who were paying off their leases that they originated in 17 um, and early 18, that when you summed the total amount of what they paid for the truck, they were able to still get more than that in the secondary market for that unit. So um, to put it into context, imagine go making seven, six years worth of payments on your car, uh, where the total of payments is, you know, 54,000 or 60,000 or whatever it is, and then selling it for 72. Um, yeah. It's just, it's, it, <laughs> what? Right. And so yeah. in that we made some mistakes um, and we learned from them and we allowed ourselves the ability to be frustrated about the mistakes, celebrate the successes. Uh, but our, our best year in the history of the company was, uh, you know, 2021, uh, our second best year in the company was, was last year. Uh, you would sure. expect it to have been 2020, but, uh, we're still performing at a, at a real high level, even in the midst of all that. So, well, and one thing I'm going to go back to how you kind of introduced Fox point. Um, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air, a technology company that provides transportation financing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And especially with inventory where you need to get more out of it because it's a supply chain issue, yeah. that phone call that you make to somebody and you just save them having to go rebuild an engine that's not going to be available for another six to nine months. And then right. how are they going to pay their bills? I mean, that's, that's huge. Right. Exactly. That's, that's a big, that's, and, that's a partnership right there. It, it it's is. not just a monetary transaction. And, and it's one of those scenarios too, uh, Jesse, that it's, it's a lot like consumer credit in the sense of we have to build the trust with the driver. It's on us to deliver on the things that we say we're going to do, uh, to, to deliver on the support that we're going to provide. And, you yep. know, we could have a member for three years. And the minute that we don't do something for them, whether we promise it or not, because expectations are a real son of a bitch. And I apologize if I can't curse on this. Um, expectations are really, really difficult. And um, even if the expectation is unfounded, our inability to match that expectation can, can ruin, you know, three years worth of positivity that then we just, we got to go back to the, got to go back to the, the ax and keep grinding back at it to build sure. it back. Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. and so, it's not, you know, I, I can simply answer to people when they say, hey, Krauss, what do you do? Hey, I lease trucks. Um, yeah, we do that. But it's so much more. <laughs> and the example that I like to give is, um, and I don't, I don't think we're unique in this, by the way. I, I, I think it's probably almost anything that you start dipping your toe in, into the middle of logistics. It's, uh, to use Shrek's analogy, right, it's an onion. And you just keep peeling it back and there's more and more. And sometimes it makes you cry. Uh, sometimes it's stinky. Uh, and other times, you know, it's just fine. And so th there's so much complexity into what goes on in the transportation industry. The fact that it is a leading economic indicator of the overall health of the United States economy and the fact that there is a ton of inefficiency inside of transportation. And when I say inefficiency, I mean, um, there's brokerage inefficiency, there's truck brokerage inefficiency, the freight brokerage inefficiency. Um, th there's not a lot of high level um, technology that's employed at a continuous basis versus other industry segments. Um, it's, and, it, and it's, you know, I, I think the tech nerd in me would want to say it's ripe for disruption. And, uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> you, you can't necessarily disrupt this environment in that manner like you could with a uh, 
a, a, a Facebook or a, or an Instagram. It, it's not like that. It's you, you have to be able to prepare for, let me pause. The best example for what I think transportation is, is uh, go, if, if, if your viewers, if you yourself, uh, if you go find a grandparent or a parent that still owns a, I, I don't know, mid seventies, mid eighties car, go pop the hood, pull the head off of it, turn it over, have it run. And then uh, tell, then try to change the oil while the engine's running. Um, that's what trying to change logistics is like, right? Like uh, it, there's just so many moving parts and there's so many things that are relying upon other things that you can't just come in with some technology, one piece. It, it has to be holistic. Um, but yet it's sure. so, it, there's so much room for improvement all over the place um, that it's, it's so rewarding and challenging at the same time. Sure. No, that's fantastic. And then once you do that and your customer sees you, I am fairly certain that your renewal rate or people doing add-ons or referrals they need a new truck, they're going to they're the come largest, back. Yeah, the referrals yeah. are our largest source of business. Um, it, yeah. it's, it's not rare to, <clears throat> for lack of a better term, um, perform well for one individual over the course of the first four to six months. And then to all of a sudden have 12 or 15 of his friends or her friends come in and request trucks. Um, and, you know, referrals are positive and negative. The positive, of course, is they don't, they don't cost much marketing money. They already understand your program. I mean, the, the, the referrals, uh, the pros are obvious. The cons are uh, you have to provide a high level of service just like you provided to that guy. And oh, so abs abs again, absolutely. It's that absolutely. time that causes us all to rise. Um, yeah. Which is which is consistently sharpening, consistently making us better in the marketplace. Yeah, another thing you mentioned earlier was it was that eighty twenty rule, and you know I was in the software space for um, what ten plus years, mm -hmm. and even currently in the software space with uh, one of my clients. And what's nice now is being on the consulting side is you just kind of go in and you can bluntly say, "Why do you need that?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's well, this one. No. Give me a yeah. business case of why you need that. Yeah. Um, and I've always been on the business development side for my entire career. Since I'm, believe it or not, I'm born in 81. So I guess I'm on the cusp of being a millennial. Yep. yep. Whatever. I don't, uh, it's a big gap. Um, but like, I've always, you know, now it's just like, back that up. Show me why. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. five years ago, congratulations. No, we're not doing that. Right. No, we're not, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not taking, not granted every customer is important. I get that, mm -hmm. but you're not that special. Like yeah. we don't need to, you know, we don't need to disrupt the other big portion of our business to accommodate one. And it's nice to be in a position where you can actually tell someone, I don't think it's a good business fit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Which is fantastic. And, and that yeah. happens that happens. So part of our process up front is um, outside of the referrals, we do a ton of uh, online marketing. And, you know, part of our, our uh, lease origination process is the explanation of what's going on. And you will get, uh, and it's not just simply filling out an application. There's some, there's some hurdles that are there. Hey, we need some documentation. And we'll get some prospective members that will say, I'm not going to provide that. And uh, the response is, man, I appreciate you telling me that information. Uh, we, we require it. And if you're not willing to provide it, then we're just not going to be doing business together. And, and there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like the whole ghosting mentality. There. Cause, cause I remember I go back to like the software days and it's like, when you sell something, nothing is perfect. Mm -hmm. if something's perfect. It's too good to be true. There's something wrong, mm -hmm. but you can pretty much tell if someone's going to be a, a problematic partner. Yeah. And yeah. you sit there and two years later, you're like, why did we do that? Yeah. It's like, well, we knew about this all up front. Just end it, end it right. Right. Just there's, say, look, there's this is how this is going to go. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like you need Vince Vaughn to, to, to sit there and just rattle it out real fast. It's like, yeah, right, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's, there's, there's total red flags all, all over the place. And, and I think, uh, you know, I don't necessarily, I, I don't have a real defined thought process here, but from a from a supplier standpoint, um, it's rare for uh, a company to refuse service. 
right? And and without getting political or caught up into you know some really minor <laughs> stuff, right? Um, yeah. A yeah. company taking the stance of no, we want to partner with people that have similar values that we do, and mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you don't. We don't match your standards because that's usually the the what we're communicating. Hey, you know, we're not willing to lease you this eighty thousand dollar unit in the middle of June of twenty twenty two without you providing us some of your background information or who you're driving for or whatever. Right? Uh, some prospective members don't have a problem with that. Some do. And um, I'm, I'm reminded, um, there's a friend of mine who was telling me a story, a card company in the mid nineties, right? Uh, this guy's running a, a couple, you know, 10, 15 salespeople. And one of the sales guys says, yo, we need to meet in person. I got this really great idea. Um, this salesperson was assigned a rather large account and he came to the greeting card sales manager and said, we need to sell flags, right? Because my, my vendor wants us to have a 4th of July stand where we're selling flags. and um, come on, man. Like you, you got to know what you're getting in the middle of. It's a greeting card company. It's not a flag production company. They're not trying to bring in additional revenue by selling flags. Um, knowing what you do and who you want to partner with and what you're willing to do, uh, is, sure. is so, is so important. Right. And having the position that you can pick and choose who you do business with, um, I'm not so desperate to go put anybody into one of our, uh, one of our leases. Uh, we're, we're very picky because it's a four-year partnership, man. Um, and, and we need them to be successful, not only for ourselves, um, you know, selfishly, uh, but we want to reciprocate the ability for a guy to, or a gal to own their own truck and win inside of transportation. Sure. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. It's all about core competencies. And even and even this in this consulting, you know, arena that I'm now in, there's some opportunities that come my way and they're like, oh, you know, this is perfect for you. And I'm kind of like, eh, yeah, it could be, but yeah. this person here, that's what they specialize in. Mm-hmm. But I want to work with you. Mm, let's Sorry. just fi- figure out a way. If you want me to be there in a secondary position, sure, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. gladly be there, but I'm doing you a disservice by not having the expert handle this for you. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, the, back to the 80-20, the, the more we can develop the processes um, to, to handle the, the 20% of the people that are causing, or 20% of the challenges, not people, 20% of the challenges that are being caused, the more procedural we can get there. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we had to overcome really quick in my tenure here Uh, was we thought there was quite a bit of square peg, square hole things inside of this industry. And like I said, man, it's that, it's that onion. Uh, There's a whole, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't necessarily fit. And so you have to spend mental energy until you can figure out the process or hire the right people. Um, And that's one of the other things at Fox Point too, that we've done. And I'm sure you know, this is you just hire good people and figure out where they fit. Um, I I don't think, I don't think anybody would have given me a sniff at being in an executive position. Um, to be able to be here, but we've got such a great team um, that it made, it made sense uh, from a career standpoint. They're, they're just, when you've got the right team around you, right? And maybe they're not in the right role, like you were saying, maybe I don't have a couple people in their core competency, but until we find the person that has that core competency, I know that they're really skilled at what they're doing sure, and, and, sure. and we'll figure it out. And that's that's been part of the iterative process of who we are also. No, that's uh, that's fantastic. And it's like I said, this whole, when we spoke, when you reached out a few weeks back and had it, it was refreshing. And now it's even more refreshing as we kind of dig further down this uh, uh, rabbit hole here, Josh. So yeah. thank yeah. you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate that. And, and you know, it using your platform, the one thing that I would want to be able to communicate is if I could wave a magic wand that everybody that that listens to this podcast would be, hey, spend two or three hours with the people that are your most creative problem solvers in your organization and figure out why are the, what are the pain points for our customers and what are we doing to communicate through them? So can you see the problem? Then can you understand what's causing the problem? And then what are you doing to influence change of the problem? And if you can be able to communicate that and partner with your, your customers, um, I think a lot of the truck driver respect challenges change, 
um, yeah. I, I, I think it I think it becomes less systemic. Um, you know, and to bring that to point, I don't know if you're aware of this. There was a bill that got passed uh, or got presented to the floor at the end of 2022 that was going to require distribution facilities uh, use of their restrooms to drivers. And it's like, we got to make this in 2022 a law? Like, I, maybe it's just Midwestern. Um, <laughs> Listen, if somebody knocked on my door and they're walking their dog and they're doing that walk and they say, hey, man, I need to use your restroom. It's like, yeah, here, let me hold your dog. It's right around here. Come in here. Right. Like you've got a guy or gal. Sorry, I keep saying guy that is delivering you goods that you are going to sell and make all of your publicly traded gross margin reportable. And you have to pass a law for that person to be able to use your facilities restrooms like yeah if, if anything unfortunately it's just a sign of the times where people just like need to just be good people i don't know how to say it any better than that right and, like, and 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 that's it you know in the the we sat around in a group in the middle of 2019 and we were trying to figure out hey wh what are we screwing up here and somebody i think interrupted the meeting by saying hey asset one two three four five six is having difficulties and not me, I, I by mo no means, I'm never the smartest guy in the room. It's always somebody else said, there it is. I was like, what are you talking about? A truck having problems? He's like, no, we don't talk about the person. We talk about the truck. And it was like, oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we still do it. It's still there, right? Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's not, nothing's ever going to be perfect. And then when, yeah. when, you know, you have to. You have to be able to improvise, um, you know, just because, like you said, something of success. Yeah, it's a poor teacher. I get that. Um, you know, as some of these initiatives that I constantly work on, man, it's like, oh, you're doing such a great job. Eh. Yeah, I think we're making good progress, but yeah, always looking for ways to improve. And, yeah. you know, last thing you want to do is when you think you're doing things well and you get negative feedback, it's, I think it's human psychology to wall up and be like, well, you're not doing it that way or you do it yourself. Right. But it, right. but it takes, that's one of the things that I still work on. I still, yeah. I still work on that because it's like, okay, well, how could I be doing this better? Yeah. There's a, <laughs> one of my coworkers, um, he consistently reminds me, you know, evolve or die. Right. That's a, that's another good one. Um, yep. He talks about the museum of failures and how, you know, Oreo has just a huge uh, amount of contributions there of things that they've tried. Um, but they're trying, right? Chips Ahoy's not there. Oreo is. And at the Super Bowl party, what do you what do you what do you want covered in chocolate? Would you rather have a, an Oreo covered in chocolate, or are you going for a Chips Ahoy? Uh, I know that I can't keep a, a, a package of Oreos in my house, and uh, Chips Ahoy are great because I can always have one because nobody else eats them except me. Um, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. there, there's some That's there's fair. some proof in the pudding on that stuff. And um, we have to continue to evolve. And yeah, it's a sign of the times that you have to legally spell out whether someone can use your restroom or not. Okay, but humans are driving our trucks, spending over 300 plus days in their cabs away from their families to provide us with the goods that we're ordering from Amazon, to provide sure. us with the furniture we're buying at Ikea. And they are not secondary to us. They are not, they, they deserve more respect um, than we would provide other people because of just the general crap that they have to deal with on an ongoing basis. And just like you've kind of alluded to in this podcast a couple of times, they have to figure out how to get from point A to point B when things break uh, and they have no explanation for it, right? Like, why would this thing break when I just had it checked? Why would I get a flat tire here? Why would all of a sudden my turn signal not work? All, all this sort of stuff. That's the life of a truck driver. Um, and they keep pounding. They just, they just, they just keep figuring it out. Sure. Sure. No, man, all, all solid points here. So I do have to ask you, Yeah. Um, I asked everyone on here, a fun fact about yourself. So aside from what you've kind of covered throughout this conversation, what makes you tick outside of Saturday, uh, Friday morning basketball with your, with some friends there? Um. There's only one other qualified subject that I would be on a podcast for, and it's probably video games. Um, <laughs> so, so um, 
if you I, say my, Fortnite, if you say Fortnite, I'm deleting this entire thing. It's fine. Um, I, <laughs> there's been a there's been a age or there's been a year gap years gap with my children where uh, you know I would play games um, that they had no idea because they were at, at bed uh, in bed. But uh, now my oldest has gotten to the point that he he plays Fortnite and he can take his dad and carry him all the way, right? Uh, but I've been playing, there's a couple of video games that you could span my 40 years and I've, I've played them solid through those, you know, past 30. Um, and it, it's, a, sure. for me, the fun fact is I'm an introvert by the definition of I gain energy by being by myself, not being around other people. Um, obviously succeeding through sales, that may seem a little counter, but I, I do have to recharge. And one of the ways that I recharge is, um, listen, man, plugging in the old Nintendo and playing some Zelda or some Mario or some Mario Kart. I'm a mean Mario Kart player and there's a lot of trash that gets talked. Um, and, and now with children to be able to crush their souls and dreams uh, while they play and let them know that they'll never be professional. Uh, that would be the only other thing that I have any level of expertise in uh, to be able to communicate on a podcast platform. Uh, would be uh, you know, games and, and, uh, and, and some FPSs. So, no, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. I mean, my son and I, um, we play Apex. Yeah. And, like, we'll yeah, sit there, like, for, for, like, Fortnite? No. Like, I just, oh. I, couldn't, I couldn't understand the concept where it was like someone pretty much summed it up in a TikTok I saw the other day where someone shot somebody and that idiot, like, well, not idiot, that person Built started building, building this castle and then they no. went up on the, and the person pulled out a chair, <laughs> sat down and watched the person build the castle and then the person peeked over the wall and he shot him in the head. Right, <laughs> it's right. like, ah, yeah, yeah. way to go, way to so, go. So, uh, I'm, like, I'm like an old school halo. Like I want to just walk up and hit somebody. Exactly. Not, like, so, so you build a wall in front of me? Like, nah, I'm, I'm the not newest, good. The newest Halo came out and that's when I grabbed my son and said, hey, play this with me. Cause I played it in college in Halo 1, Halo 2. And he was really good uh, with the old BR. And then all of a sudden his friends started playing Fortnite. So we had that peer pressure. Then Fortnite released a no build mode. And that's the only way that I'd get in the middle of it because I am, I'm a, I'm a Halo dude. I'm a Destiny dude. I, I, I'm not a, hey, let's quick twitch, do all this with my hands real quick. And next thing you know, it's Mickey Mouse's castle, right? Or whatever. So I'm in the same boat that you are. I played a bunch of Apex. So um, love it, right? That's that's for me, that's the relief. So as you stated in your question, outside of basketball, I, I love to play. I love to coach, um, uh, coaching my kids, um, watching, lo love basketball, uh, play a lot of video games and uh, know a lot about transportation. There's, there's, the, awesome. there's the three things. The fun fact would be, I wish I had it. I would give you a pie chart that would show um, about a 5% piece in green, the rest in red, and it would be uh, the amount of curse words I've used in my entire life's cause, and the red would be Mario Kart, which is 95%, and then the 5% would be other. Uh, the, 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 the sailor mouth that comes on me when you turn on Mario Kart 8 and the blue shell comes out of nowhere uh, is a blue streak. So uh, that, would the, that, would be, that would be it. So. Fantastic fly on the wall. I see a YouTube channel in the making at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, I thought about, you know, streaming with my kid and because I'll pull a play out mm, very rarely and he pulls them out all the time. But I think I think it would be engaging enough contact. The problem is, is time, um, not not necessarily my time, but uh, by the time I get on to play, it's already his bedtime. So we yeah, have to no, I, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Josh. Well, you know, I appreciate you giving me an hour of your time today, man. Yeah. Um, it's good chatting with you on here. And, um, you know, hopefully our past, we have a way to get our past across here sometime in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to catch up uh, outside of technology where we just shoot, shoot, shoot what's going on and shoot the bull. And maybe it would be a West Virginia K State game somewhere, somehow. Uh, I, could... would, I, would, I would be down for that. Um, All right. Uh, would, would, would love to see some Big 12 action. All right. Absolutely, Josh. Appreciate your time today, man. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Jesse.